everyone, and thank you so much for joining us over your lunch hour for today's presentation on using collaborative practice methods and principles with non-CP trained professionals with Carrie Heinzel, Jonathan Painter, and Russell Alexander. If we haven't met before, my name is Shannon, and I'm part of the community engagement and events team at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. I'm just going to start with a bit of housekeeping. I'll let you know what's on the agenda for today and introduce our panelists. Um, following that, I'll be behind the scenes for most of the presentation once I pass things over to our panelists and I'll be available for any questions or tech issues that may come up. You will notice that the chat function isn't available and that's just to ensure that all audience members remain anonymous to others. Um, however, you can message me via the Q&A or email me at shannon at russellalexander.com with any questions or comments for our team and I'll make sure to put my email in the in the chat box for your reference. So uh, on the agenda today, in this one hour presentation, Russell, Carrie, and Jonathan will be sharing their insights on collaborative practice covering the following topics, advocacy, litigation, and conflict resolution. What is collaborative practice? The allegory of the cave, Plato's Republic, book four, the strength of team, the importance of- allegory of the cave in there. What kind of crazy person did that? <laughs> Whose idea was that? I won't name names, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, we'll have unknown knowns and confidence issues, encouraging collaborative practice training. And once the presenters have shared their closing thoughts, there also there will also be a Q and A segment at the end of the presentation. So if you haven't already, please feel free to submit your questions, um, any general questions on the topic via the Q and A, and we'll do our best to get to those at the end of the presentation um, as well as throughout. And we do ask that everyone please keep in mind that the content of this webinar is to provide you with general information um, and should not be considered as legal advice. And just a note that I'll be providing links to additional resources um, in a follow-up email tomorrow for your reference on today's topic. And without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's host from the greater Toronto area. We have Carrie Heinzel, Jonathan Painter, and Russell Alexander. So Carrie is the founder of Fairmore Family Law Financial Solutions, and Fairmar offers independent fact-based financial analytics and settlement insights to individuals and couples working through separation and divorce. Carrie is an active collaborative process trainer, co-teaching the introductory program for new collaborative professionals and advanced level trainings for the seasoned practitioner. Carrie has taught statistics, research methodology, methodologies and psychology at college and university levels. In addition, Carrie has pre presented at conferences for the Ontario Association of Collaborative Professionals, Family Dispute Resolution Institute of Ontario Annual Conference, and the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Next, we have Jonathan Painter, and Jonathan is a registered social worker and psychotherapist who works in the family court system, completing custody and access assessments, parenting capacity assessments, and youth court assessments. He specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and couples counseling and holds certificates in collaborative family law, advanced family mediation, family arbitration, domestic violence screening, offender relapse prevention, and actuarially assessment of risk. Jonathan is on the board of directors of the Ontario Association for Family Mediation, holding the executive position as secretary of the board, as well as being chair of the accreditation and the course approval committees. Lastly, we have Russell, and Russell is the founder and senior partner of Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. With over 20 years of experience, Russell offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise in collaborative family law. He uses his experience with a client-focused approach by creating unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward with their lives in a compassionate and collaborative manner. So now that you know a little bit more about our panelists today, I am going to pass things over to Russell to get started. We've got a guarantee, right? <laughs> Come on, let's throw it out there. <laughs> As always, we wouldn't miss this for any presentation. Shannon hates this part of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> We have a money back guarantee for our complimentary event series, and we will always honor that. But how can you go wrong, right? Thank you for joining us over your lunch hour. We're going to do polls throughout, so be responsive to the polls so we can get an idea of who our audience is today. Uh, oftentimes, we get lots of professionals, so we're going to want to tailor our content to the audience. We have uh, Q&As that have come in in advance, but please use the Q&A box. Send in your questions. We're trying to get us to, through as many questions as we can. We're also going to save some time at the end for Q&A. 
you've got the guarantee. Shannon and I have a re request we're going to make midpoint. If you're enjoying the program, we're going to want your feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but your feedback is really important because it helps us understand uh, what's working and what's not. And I think we have another offer, right, Shannon? We do. Uh, so um, for those who do provide their feedback um, by the survey at the end of the webinar that will come up, um, we have a complimentary ebook on collaborative divorce. This is actually a collaboration between Russell and Carrie and Brian Galbraith, who isn't here today, but um, we'll be offering that um, as a sign of our appreciation for those who provide their feedback. So you get a takeaway and it doesn't cost anything. All right, let's do our first poll question. Let's see who our audience is. So tell us about yourself. Um, we're going to have a number of choices here. We'll give everybody a few minutes to go through them. But as we're waiting, let's get to some of our audience questions. Um, how do you how do how to request third party all right third party demand for disclosure after many years of non disclosure, including court order for the applicant to produce the disclosure? Well. I, I, you know, if it's court order, you're in contempt of court, right? And the pleadings would be struck. But I guess in a cl collaborative setting, uh, what would you do, Carrie? Somebody's not playing nice. Uh, honestly, uh, sometimes what we find when people are not providing their disclosure is either they're overwhelmed by it, by the absent request, um, or they just don't know where to start. Um, I find that when we're working with our clients, uh, just us lending the helping hand of getting them to do things, it's really, really been um, successful for us and, and for the people that we're working for. For those that have been reluctant to provide, we have found that working with a third party like our firm, um, they're a little bit more willing to give us information. They feel like it's a little bit more secure, a little bit safer for some reason. And so they're happy to give it to us. You're neutral, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we've got a lot of poll answers here, let's get to another question. Give everybody a few minutes to uh, put their answers in. All right. Um, how does this collaborative practice work in situations where parenting uh, involves young children? Jonathan, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's really a great process for families who have young children because the team works really hard together to help the parents um, avoid conflict. Um, or if there is conflict, they have people that they can go to to resolve that conflict. So when when I'm working with Carrie, Carrie is the one who deals with um, any conflict around the finances. Uh, if there's conflict around parenting time or decisions about the kids or uh, communication between the parents, um, myself or, um, Whoever uh, is the family professional in that um, team can help with that. Um, the lawyers are are always uh, super helpful at uh, um, supporting Carrie and and my work or the the family or financial professionals. So um, I think it can really uh, help uh, a lot with uh, parents of young families to help uh, get them through the process with as little conflict as possible because we know that conflict is really bad for kids. Uh, especially if it re reaches a certain threshold that it causes them toxic stress. And we really want to avoid that as much as possible. And collaborative is the best way to do that. I think it's a, a perfectly a perfect match. Oftentimes, the, the full team meeting might take a few weeks to get off the ground. But if the lawyers agree, we can get a neutral like Jonathan or another family professional involved with the parents to deal with parenting between you know, day one in that first meeting, three weeks down the road. Oftentimes I find um, we get a draft pairing agreement in place at the first meeting and it's reviewed and agreed to. So that saves five hours, right? On your first CP meeting, parenting isn't necessarily resolved, but we got some ground rules in place. But yeah, what do you think of this, Carrie? You're, you're financial neutral, but you've seen lots of families uh, with young children. Oh, absolutely. And I agree with Jonathan. I, I think there's so much emotion that swirls around when people are going through this process that having, again, a neutral person like a family professional like Jonathan, that's just helping them sort through those emotions and things like money and kids. 
they're the biggest part of all of this. And I think having some neutral people that are just looking at it in a slightly different light really helps families. Like it's just, it calms everybody down, I find. Yeah, and and you you mentioned a really key word uh, there, Russ, uh, ground rules. I think yeah. early on in the process, establishing ground rules uh, can really help reduce conflict and, and make the whole process go faster and cheaper and uh, less painfully for the, the parties involved. The questions are coming in fast and furious. Thank you, audience members. Keep them coming in. We're going to spend as much time on questions as we can. So let's see who our audience is today. Uh, family lawyer with collaborative practice training, 15%. Lawyer without collaborative practice training, 38%. While well, you're in the right place to learn about it. And we're going to have mm -hmm. some information on how you can find and get collaboratively trained. Carrie's got a course coming up in November. I think there might be one or two spots left in it. We'll give you the link and send you some more information later on. Um, family law professional with training, 2%. Uh, financial professional with training, 2%, professional without uh, collaborative training, 6%. So fairly diverse audience today and a couple of yeah. students. It's good, great to see the students. Uh, you know, last time we did our summit, I had a student comment to me that they don't teach collaborative practice in law school. It's like, what the hell are you guys doing? You're, you know, you <laughs> so years in law school, you don't even talk about collaborative practice. I, I thought that was shocking. It um, is. All right, so let's get into uh, the next slide. Thank you, Shannon. And what do we got up here? Advocacy, litigation, and conflict resolution. Jonathan's going to talk about this, but I just want to sort of introduce uh, what I was thinking when we when we put it this on the agenda. So Margie and I, we did like a six-part live event series on Divorce Act changes. And what we did is we would talk about the change, and then we would say, well, is it a win for the firefighters and peacemakers or is it a win for the arsonists and the warriors, right? So it depends on your mindset. You know, firefighters, peacemakers, we've got client or professionals who are collaboratively trained and non-collaboratively trained lawyers who want to resolve as much as they can uh, and take a peaceful, respectful approach. Uh, and clients are of that mindset as well. Then you have these arsonists and warriors, right? You know, the lawyers who think, oh, I'm a warrior, I'm going to advocate for my client, and they're going to win in court, right? That's what we're trained in law, law school to do, right? Advocacy is the basis of our justice system for 200 years. You have the arsonists, right? You've got these clients, maybe they have a mental health issue, maybe they're upset because their spouse cheated on them, I'm not sure, but they want to burn everything to the ground, right? They don't care. They don't, even if it's not in their own interest, they want to just destroy the other party, so... This is sort of our discussion, Jonathan. You know, we're talking about using these methods for non-CP trained professionals. What do you think of this sort of setup I gave you in terms of the dichotomy we see, not only between the professionals, but between our clients as well? Yeah, and, and you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that collaborative family law is not just a different process, it's a different mindset. And it's, it's a philosophy of how you work with your clients. And you really have to step away and unlearn a lot of the stuff that you might have learned that made you a good litigator or, uh, you know, a good uh, family lawyer. Um, and, you know, not to say there isn't a role for the, uh, the warriors. I'm not sure the arsonists are ever really that helpful. Um, you know, they, the slash and burn technique just leaves everyone destroyed in their wake. Um, sometimes you do need a warrior to fight for you in court or, or fight for your rights. Um, but I, I want to say that like collaborative family law is just not interrupt. successful. Just yeah, yeah. The, the example of a warrior in my mind, when we're going through the Divorce Act changes and we, they've added family violence and, you know, we've got victims of domestic abuse. That's really when you need to be a warrior for your client. Yeah. Right? You really need Point. to protect them because they're at harm's way. So that's just one example of how you know, an advocate needs to be a warrior. It's essential, yeah. especially if you're in, uh, you're dealing with those kinds of problems. But sorry, go go ahead. There is a yeah. role, but not probably not in the setting that we're talking about today. Exactly, exactly. And I, I, I wanted to uh, say that like collaborative family law isn't successful in every case. Unfortunately, I, I wish it was. However, having said that, I really don't think there's a better uh, option for families out there. 
Um, court is definitely not a better option. Like courts, you know, a really great place if you want to uh, settle a dispute between two farmers and where their property line is or sheep or whose, and that's really what it was designed to, to help settle. And it can be helpful for um, financial issues, but it's so expensive and, and so time consuming and it takes so long. Um, you know, it, it's not really well set up to help families in conflict um, and don't have the support of a financial professional and a family professional to help resolve conflict and get um, the families through the most difficult period of their lives, probably for, for a lot of the families we work with. So um, it, it is a it is a, a different mindset and a different philosophy, um, and it does take some getting used to. And I, you know, I'm sure we've all worked with lawyers who are still getting used to that um, mindset and um, um, uh, and and to make that adjustment to the philosophy that that makes this process uh, different from the adversarial process that they're probably used to. I would remember when I was doing my training a long time ago and there was a litigator who'd been doing litigation for 20 years and like it, this was five six days of training over two three sessions right two sessions I think it was back then and then day three goes I can't do this no <laughs> I'm not trained I cannot change my mind from being an advocate to looking at problems differently right and it, like People really struggle, but you know, Bev LeMay and Carrie talks about this paradigm shift. Once you see it, it it's an easy choice. Uh, do you want to add to this, Carrie, before we move on? You know what? The, the one thing that I wanted to add was just the idea of a warrior as that being that advocate. Sometimes being that advocate, being a good advocate, means you pull it out of the court system because you just realize it's not working for your clients and it's got to go. And sometimes that's your best way of doing advocacy is finding a better solution for them, a better process. And two years of court can destroy a family and your kids, you know, education fund is sad what results from yep. going to court. All right. And, so and just one, one more thing, Russ, how many times have you heard uh, lawyers say, like, I can't take litigation anymore. Like, I'm, I'm so done with the process. You know, it, it burns out the professionals as well. It's really hard on them. Right. Well, I think it's sad that they're burning out, but I'm glad, you know, a lot of those lawyers often say, I'm only going to do collaborative, right? Yeah, exactly. You, yeah. You're going to come in with me with a litigation case, go down the hallway. Um, I'm never going to, I'm never going back to court, right? Which, and they have very successful collaborative practices, right? It might not be as large as a litigation practice, but it's more time intensive. Yeah. Uh, th these clients need more but in a good way. All right, so let's go to our next slide and actually talk about what collaborative practice is. So I think we're gonna get, John, maybe, Jonathan, maybe you can help us out with this one. Yeah, so collaborative practice is, um, it's a team approach. So the, the lawyers, the family professional, the financial professional work together as a team um, to um, help parties come to an agreement on their separation details. Um, so it's considered interest-based uh, instead of position-based. So position-based is like, this is what I want. And interest is like, well, why do you want that? So if someone wants to keep the house, for example, you look at the reasons why they want to keep the house. Maybe it has a lot of sentimental value. Maybe they want stability for the kids. Maybe they love their neighbors. Maybe, you know, they, they're, they're afraid of li living in a different home. So you really want to look at the interest behind the party's positions. Um, and it's based on the principles of good faith, which means you come to the table um, genuinely to reach an agreement and not for any other purpose. Uh, you, you're honestly, honest and open about, um, um, uh, you know, about all the details. So if you share financial details with, with both lawyers. If you uh, are honest when there are financial changes uh, that uh, then have to report to the team. Um, and it's it's really about cooperation between um, all uh, six members of the team, which includes two parents and uh, four professionals usually. Um, you can obviously change that up depending on the situation. And, um, you know, it's a very adaptable process. Um, so you can really adapt it to the families that you're serving. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a cookie cutter approach whatsoever. 
no two collaborative cases are, are the same and therefore uh, no two collaborative teams operate exactly the same way. Um, but the, the principles of, of honesty, full disclosure, respect, and, um, and you know, bargaining in good faith are all really, really important. And, and the team serves to kind of guide people when they're veering off that path. If someone ends up taking a really positional um, argument in a meeting, then we'll all, we'll all work together to help that person um, help us understand the underlying interests of why they're taking that position. Um, we avoid techniques like threats of going to court and, um, you know, uh, sort of hard sell bargaining uh, um, techniques that um, can actually cause a lot of harm to the relationship between the parties that are trying to um, separate. And, and, you know, their relationship is already on the rocks. Um, do we want to throw uh, um, more stress, conflict and, and disagreement at them? Or do we want to help uh, coach them on a way of resolving these conflicts amicably and so that everyone's interests are um, are uh, identified and that we we try to meet everyone's goals. So it's not a win-lose situation between the parties who are separating. It's a win-win. How can we make sure that both parties' needs are met in the process? Yeah, you know, the, <clears throat> the this idea of threats is contrary to the principles of collaborative practice, you know, threatening to go to court, threatening to withdraw if you don't get a certain position that you're seeking, which you, you shouldn't be seeking in the first place. We agree not to take each advantage of each other's mistakes or factual errors. Uh, as a lawyer, I love that, right? You're always worried I'm going to make a mistake and got to call a law pro, but you make a mistake and call the group up and say, you know, we got the number wrong or it was transposed wrong. Um, the guidelines in the collaborative practice participation agreement uh, sort of sets out what the principles are. Uh, we'll, we'll include one in as a show note if we don't have one already lined up. Shannon, we'll get that ready for our audience. Um, Carrie, just while we're on this subject, um, mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about big C and little c collaborative in the map in a minute. And we've been known to deviate from the pure process at times when families need us to do that. But what yeah. are the advantages of what they call big C pure collaborative? What would you what would you say are important to takeaways for our audience? You know, I think one of the biggest thing is that we remove that threat of court. I think that's the biggest advantage of big C is that idea that we're not, we, and everybody has the same goal in mind. We're all settlement oriented. It is to everyone's advantage to come to a settlement. So we work a little further, we put our heads together a little bit more. Um, and it's not just, oh, well, that didn't work too bad. I, I just love that fact that we're taking away that threat. We're taking away um, the silliness that goes with court and some of the ideas that people have. And really getting to them to focus on the idea that like Jonathan said here earlier, this is a concierge service. What works for your friends and family that are giving you well-meaning advice, you know, we're tailoring this exactly to your family. And if we stay on that thought, then the idea of court is completely unnecessary. And I think that's the most wonderful thing about it. Right. And the lawyers are the lawyers are buying in, right? If it goes to court, they're not going to work on the file anymore. So some some professionals are worried. You know, that's a lawyer as a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? We're going to go to CP and they're going to make all these demands yeah. and not work together. But honestly, I don't I don't see that though. Like, no, and all the files that we work it on, I don't happen, see. But them. junior lawyers, not junior lawyers, lawyers newly collaboratively trained, are concerned, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know these professionals. I haven't worked with this group before. So there's a trust issue. But when you build up teams and you get to know other team members, other lawyers, other neutrals, then uh, it kind of snowballs after that. But that's that's a great point. We have there's a great uh, question, Russ, that uh, dovetails with that in the question and answer. Um, just asking, how do you protect yourself as a family lawyer when trying to implement a collaborative practice? And the other lawyer might initially be receptive but then reverts back to being litigious. Um, and that's where the team comes in to play. Like um, sometimes as a family or a, a financial professional, we're not just managing 
conflict between the parties, but we're also helping to manage conflict between the professionals as well. And, um, um, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in this work, like, you know, I do a lot of work as a family mediator. And if, if you're doing work as a litigator, it's very isolating and kind of do your work in a silo. And the advantage of the big C or even the little C uh, approach to collaborative is that you work in a team. And if, if any of the members of the team, whether it's the parties or professionals um, are are not um, abiding by those principles, then you know it's time for a group discussion to get things back on track. I found that to be really effective. And we, an audience member sent in a question, pretty much to that effect. As a lawyer, you're signing it. You're signing a contract. You're signing this participation agreement, and you have a professional obligation to fulfill those duties. So, if, if you're not following the agreement, you're breaching your rules of professional conduct, which could have you know, significant consequences for you. Let's throw our next poll up because it's been too long. And, and while we're <laughs> doing this poll, uh, go ahead, Carrie. I just I don't want to cut you off. I just want to get our second poll question up. Have you ever used collaborative practice? Uh, with your court cases. All right, so we're going to talk about those answers. Go ahead, Carrie. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is that I do find when somebody decides to become litigious in the file when one of the legal counsel kind of goes that way, I always find that a team meeting with the professionals to find out what the thought process is behind it because sometimes it's a knee-jerk reaction because, again, most lawyers are trained. This is how we go. And it's about finding what's behind it. So it was it a knee-jerk reaction. Can we unpack it a little bit? And I find once we do that, everybody kind of just calms down. Once there's understanding amongst the team, it kind of goes away. And we can come up with some great brainstorming ideas for the family. That's a great point, right? Name it. So I, I've been in collaborative meetings and I'm thinking, holy cow, that lawyer's being pretty positional, pretty adversarial. And so we say, you know, it's time for our morning break. And then the professional team gets together and then outside the, the clients, right? You say, you know, you're being adversarial there. Did you? And a lot of the times the lawyer didn't realize it, right? That's their basic training kicking in, you know, sort of boot camp <laughs> training from law school. And usually they apologize and the meeting goes on successfully. But if you call it out in a setting where it's not going to, you know, prejudice the client's uh, experience um, and do it soon, right? Call your morning break and just talk about it as a professional team. That was the adversarial. You're taking a position. Usually the person doing that wouldn't recognize it. Or um, like you said, Carrie, there could, could be something underlying that we need to talk about to get to that. All right, so um, let's see what our audience thinks of uh, the poll question here. All right, 66% said no. Um, clear majority, yes, we stopped the case immediately. 3%, yes, yes we put the court, court matter on hold. 6%, yes, we use collaborative principles to come to a resolution. That's a pretty good number, 17%. I like that. Uh, we engage neutrals to help come to resolution 6%. Uh, am I allowed to use CP in court? 3%. So um, no's, maybe this is going to be helpful for all the no's that we have out there. But let's move on. Um, we're a little bit, uh, we're running a little bit long, so I'm going to speed up a little bit just to catch up. So Allegory of the Cave, uh, Plato's Republic, book five. Or book four. Now, this could be a three-hour discussion right here. I think university students spend about a month uh, talking about this. I think book. I took a whole course on this. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the light symbolizes enlightenment, wisdom, darkness symbolizes um, ignorance. Real quick, uh, what am I? Th what I was thinking about here when I put this up? You know, as collaboratively trained professionals, we've seen the light. Right, we we understand this is a better process, and you come up with better results for your clients. Um, we have a duty to tell our other professionals, our colleagues, and especially our clients, this process exists, uh, and it's something you should consider. It, it saddens me when I get a client who comes into my office after two years of litigation, fired their lawyer, ran out of money, whatever whatever went wrong with that case which is usually still going. 
and I explain the collaborative process to them. And they say, you know, nobody ever told me that was an option. If I had known that, I would have never gone to court, right? So this is, you know, the allegory of the cave, there's prisoners facing a wall with shadows and light on it. This is our duty to tell our clients, to tell professionals, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this, but I'm passionate. There is a better way. Um, and even if you're dealing with non-trained professionals, uh, you could take the little C approach. So use these principles we're talking about, avoid court, educate these professionals. This is a process that we can use to resolve the case. It's, uh, it's been successful. We've done this. And oftentimes the lawyers or the professionals will then go out and get the training because they've had such a good experience in terms of working through the, the roadmap and learning how to use these steps, which have been proven for 20 years to solve litigation, conflict, family disputes successful, successfully. And then another consideration to consider, Carrie and I have a whole, and Jared Johnson have a whole live presentation that we've recorded. We'll make it available to you in the show notes to actually understand how you can modify the collaborative practice, practice the participation agreement to deal with existing court cases. Our audience has sort of given us some feedback in terms of what they've done. Stop the court completely, go full CP. That's option number one, it's great. A lot of times there's trust issues or disclosure issues, or there's an issue that needs to be conferenced. It could be a legal issue where you could go either way on a capital gain or a data marriage deduction. Um, so what we've done is we've said, okay, we're gonna do CP and we're only gonna go to, we only agree we will go to court to deal with one issue. And we'll put that in the collaborative practice agreement. It could be a support issue, a disclosure issue, any issue. And then mm -hmm. that gives the clients the peace of mind saying, okay, well, I'm gonna give it a try, right? You know, I'm not losing everything we've done in court. We'll put that on hold. A quick example, again, we could talk an hour just on this one point about amending the collaborative practice agreement. We had um, a corporation we're valuing and a corporate director was not producing disclosure. So we went back to our case management judge, got an order that the disclosure be produced. The corporate director complied, the case settled two weeks later. So that's an example where you need that big stick to deal with the third party who's not part of the CP process to uh, move the matter forward. So that's the allegory of the cave in four minutes or less. Let's go to our next poll because we haven't done a poll question in a while. And I'm not gonna ask any feedback on the allegory of the cave because I wanna get back on time. If we have time at the end, I'll get your put, input on that. All right, so what do we got up here? Have you worked with a full CP team? All right, this is a good one. And we've got some Q and A coming in. I just wanna clarify some of the questions that, that came in. Somebody put, um, OFW, I'm not sure what that means. Put it Our on. family wizard. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can use the, that. A user. parenting app, yeah. You're so smart, Jonathan. So yeah, <laughs> you can use that as part of this. Because I recommend it almost every day, Russ. <laughs> One of our students said um, they teach ADR in law school. Well, that's good. Did they talk about collaborative practice? That's what I want to know. Is that part of the ADR? I don't think so. It might be, uh, but the students I'm talking to are saying, no, there's no no collaborative practice uh, lectures or training provided at law school. So the ADR includes it, put it in there. Another quick question, um, they're coming in and I love, keep the questions coming in. Jonathan, what about people with mental illness? Um, we bring them into this process? Is it yes, any comment on that? Absolutely. And I, I think that that is a great example of a situation where uh, the collaborative approach can be really helpful because you have a trained mental health uh, um, worker as part of the team. I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing someone with serious, I mean, a lot of people have mental health issues, anxiety, depression, but they're able to manage it. For the people who aren't able to manage it, um, you know, having a team with a family professional can help uh, support that person, um, get them the referrals they need to counseling or other treatment, help manage their symptoms, uh, help support them through the cloud of meetings, because sometimes they can be a little stressful for people. And if you have difficulty dealing with stress, sometimes having that support person can be really helpful. Uh, think of um, the same person going to court 
Um, they get no support. Um, they are alone. The judge doesn't really get uh, the time to um, understand or, or help with their mental health issues. So I, I really think that that would be a, a prime example of a situation where collaborative would be a, a great approach. For someone uh, has, you know, mental health issues that aren't being well managed. All right, let's throw our poll results. I'm going to do some rapid fire uh, answers to these questions coming in. Can a self-represented party ask for the court for CP? No, it's, it's a process that is done inside of the court system. A lot of case management judges used to be collaboratively trained lawyers, so encourage parties to pursue it. And then there's information we're, we're going to give you where you can learn more about collaborative practice and professionals that are available. Is there bursaries or support from the law society for a lawyer interested in certification? No, this is like any other CPD course that you take as part of your professional obligation each year. I think it's up to 12 hours, including one hour diversity training. Carrie's gonna talk about how you can learn more and get trained and send you a link for the November training. Yep. Um, do mediators get involved with collaborative lawyers? Um, you know, we're seeing more and more of that, especially in the US where there'll be mediators brought in to resolve certain uh, roadblocks that parties or uh, people are hitting. Maybe I'll ask you for some more about that um, at the end, Jonathan. And uh, the law student says we are talking about collaborative practice at her school or his school. I'm not sure. That's great news. All right. So let's thank you for everybody. Keep the uh, questions coming in. We're going to get to as many as we can. Uh, have you worked with a full CP team? Yes, 20%. No, 55%. Well, you're in the right spot because we're going to talk about that right now. I worked with one professional, 11%. What's the full team? All right, so let's get to our <laughs> next slide. Carrie, take it away. All right, so your full team is uh, two lawyers. So one lawyer for each client, they are the advocate. You have a financial professional that is going to look with everything that is money. Wonderful thing about working with a financial professional is it helps to remove some of the emotion that happens with money and uh, some of the accusations that can come sometimes show up. I pretty much hear on a daily basis that someone is hiding money. This is not usually the case. Um, and um, we can, we kind of shine a light where people just trust what we're saying simply because we're not emotionally involved. Um, the other wonderful strength of a full team is our family professional. The family professional has a very unique job. They are, by the way, they are, whether there are children involved in the file or not. Um, a lot of times people will think we don't need a family pro professional because they're not children. But there are other dynamics that are involved and it's really helpful. Somebody may not be prepared for the separation and someone like Jonathan or a family professional is wonderful at helping unpack some of those feelings and issues that go behind it. Um, Jonathan touched on it earlier. The strength of the team is that we are there as a professional community to support each other, to find the best resolutions for the family. And I really want to stress that our resolutions are family-based, not individual-based. So what's going to be the best for everyone involved? We want to make sure that that's happening. We find out things as a family professional or as a financial professional. Clients tell us stuff that they don't tell their lawyers. And so we then get this wonderful array of information coming from everybody so that we can actually put together the best possible solution for the family. I like to call it their owner's manual afterwards. <laughs> That's the separation agreement. <laughs> is that the manual you get when you have kids too? Let's throw up our next poll. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and there, we have this concept that we we talk about called supersized teams. We don't have time to get in today. We've got a recording. We'll try to make it part of the show notes where... You not just have four, two lawyers and maybe a neutral and a family professional. Your team gets supersized uh, and for good reason. All right. So next poll question. Does collaborative practice, does collaborative practice require disclosure? We'll give everybody a minute. Uh, great question that came in here. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to throw this at you. 
What role does the voice of the child, oh, and for the law student, they said it does have CP training, put in the Q&A, how many hours or how extensive the CP training was at law school as part of the ADR? And that's going to, we'd like to know. All right, Jonathan, what role does the voice of the child play in the process we are proposing, whether it's big C or small C? Yeah, great question. And that's where a family professional can really help. Um, particularly with older kids, um, the research shows that when, when the, um, the team obtains their views and preferences and helps incorporate those views and preferences into whatever uh, parenting time agreement the parents come up with, uh, the children are happier about it and um, they, they feel like they've had a voice. So a family professional can certainly uh, get involved, speak to the kids and uh, find out what their views and preferences are. And I do that all the time. O almost every case I've had uh, recently has uh, involved um, the voice of the child. And I think it's uh, a growing trend. I think it's a good trend. Um, just make sure that the family professional is experienced and, and trained in interviewing children because it is a, a very specific set of skills and um, uh, qualities that are needed in order to do that well. Okay, let's get our poll results out. I'm going to do some shameless promotion here. Um, we have a uh, we have a whole live event just on the voice of the child. Not, like, not yet, Shannon, not yet. <laughs> just on the voice of the child. And Jonathan's part of that. So if you want to learn more, uh, or if you want to go to the Durham Region um, Conference, it's coming up, I think, next week. Thursday. Next Thursday. Live in person. There's still a few spots open. I think registration was extended. Jonathan will be presenting in person, Voice of the Child. I'm going to get down and watch him. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, so if you want to learn more, there's an opportunity to meet us in person and learn more. Um, so what's our audience think here? Uh, yes, full disclosure, well, we get pretty good, pretty good answer. Uh, but before we get to disclosure, now we can do the shameless plug. So uh, um, what we're gonna ask for is your feedback. And we usually ask at the end, but we're gonna ask for it right now. We're gonna put a link in the, into the chat box. You can click it, give us your feedback, good, bad, and different. You're not gonna hurt our feelings. We wanna know how we're doing. More importantly though, Shannon and I are in a competition with our colleagues at our office to see who can get the most reviews this month. <laughs> Top person gets a prize. So if you enjoy Shannon's work, um, take, it'll take less than 15 seconds, click the button, give Shannon a review, give her a plug, let us know how we're doing. You want to, if you want us to talk about other topics, put it in there. We'll just, we've, a lot of the programs we're doing has been a result of audience feedback. Um, so please, please, please give us your feedback. Much appreciated. All right. So disclosure, Carrie. Um, yeah. This is a big topic. What, what, what do we need to know? We're, we're talking about collaborative practice principles mm -hmm. on trained professionals. Disclosure. Again, a one, a one hour topic, but yeah. give us, I'll, give honestly, us the cold notes. What do we need to know here? It's full disclosure is the headline. Um, our view is it's got to be full disclosure. I believe that people that have good information will make good decisions. So you can't make good decisions without having everything in front of you and knowing the consequences of stuff. You know, I've had many times where clients have said, oh, we've decided we're not going to um, deal with our pensions. We're just going to leave those alone. And my answer to that is you can do that, but only after we know exactly what you're giving up. And it's been really interesting because people have come to me and said, we're not going to do the pensions. And it's like, great, we're just going to get them valued anyways. And somebody comes back with a $200,000 pension and their spouse comes back with a million dollar pension. I can guarantee you the idea of we're not going to equalize the pensions goes away very quickly. Um, we want the full disclosure. We want people knowing. We don't want people years down the road, if something goes sideways, for somebody to decide, I'm going to reopen all the money and you have to go through this all again. Let's get it right the first time. It's cheaper, it's easier, it's smarter, and you're going to make a better decision for your family. Um, having all the cards on the table helps. And when people don't, by the way, my experience has been that people that try to get around full disclosure have a tendency to lie 
in the wrong way. It's always someone that makes it worse for them. Having said all of that, though, with full disclosure, there are times, specifically date of marriage items, where you just simply cannot achieve getting the documentations. It's way past limitation periods. There are some workarounds that we can do depending on the information. But we found with a lot of date of marriage stuff, somebody said, I had a car. And the other spouse goes, yeah, they had a car. Absolutely. And we can do agreed upon values for certain things. Other things I'm saying, absolutely no. You get us the info. If it's available, we want the information. All right. Let's go to our next poll. Thank you, Carrie. Um, My does using uh, collaborative practice principles um, or getting CP training make you a better advocate? So we'll give everybody a moment here. I'm just checking online. We've had two people of our over 60 people here leave us a uh, comment. So you have time to click the button, give us your feedback. Uh, we've got lots of people who haven't given us their feedback yet. So please, it's important to us. But we have more audience questions too. Um, this one came in ahead of time. Why would I let another spouse uh, delay or use the CP process to take advantage of my client? Yee. That's a bit of a nasty question. Carrie, what do you think? I guess you could be delaying your disclosure. That's a concern. But this is maybe a limiting belief this person has before they enter the CP process would be my takeaway. What do you uh, think? Yeah, honestly, I, I think anybody that's kind of throwing down collaborative practice may not understand it fully. They may not have engaged in, in a, a collaborative meeting, whether they've been collaboratively trained or not. We have collaborative professionals that are not sure about how to do things. Um, but, you know, the principles are there. The principles are about settlement. They are about, you know, getting people to look at things a little differently. It's a holistic approach. Um, I think that's the most important thing that we have is making sure we're looking after the family as a whole. Everybody's... Yeah, and there's there's different ways of, uh, you know, like you said, Carrie, very eloquently, uh, it's, there's different ways of, of meeting your client's goals. Um, sometimes the slash and burn uh, is not the best way to do it. It's not gonna, You know what? I've always looked at collaborative practice as the best of all worlds. We get the best of litigation and you get the best of mediation is what collaborative practice is. You have your own advocate, somebody that's really going to explain things to you and really have you understand your rights and entitlements and all of those things. And then you have the best part of two mediators, really. I'm, I'm, I have mediation training. I know that Jonathan's a full-fledged mediator. And, but we're going to help mediate those things on your financials and on your family things. And so you get the mediation meet and you get the litigation meet and you just put it all together into this phenomenal process that, by the way, takes far less time than going to court. Yeah. The CR poll results. Great question came in here, Jonathan. I want a short answer if it's possible. Can CP work for families with domestic violence? I remember when we started, we used to screen everybody. Red flag, no. Red flag, no. I think this is sometimes a better setting uh, for victims of, with victims of domestic violence. You can do shuttle mediation. You don't have to see your spouse in court in the, you know, like 10 feet away from you when you go to your hearing. But what, what's your take, Jonathan? Yeah, because the process is so adaptable, you can uh, do things to help accommodate uh, cases that have domestic violence. Um, and uh, I, I would hope that every family professional out there has domestic violence training. Um, I certainly have a, a ton as part of my meeting training. I know Carrie has a ton as well. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, we, we can accommodate that and have meetings where the parties aren't in the same room together, whether that's physically not in the same room or you know, a Zoom room. So there's lots of ways to accommodate that. Full answers, yes, 100%. Uh, makes you see both sides of the case. Mm -hmm. I know when I got my training, I would go to court on non-collaborative matters. <laughs> I would say to the, the lawyer, you know, you're being adversarial with me. 
And I would, you know, like it, that's a dirty word. They're like, word. yeah, right? of course. Like, well, that's what I do. I'm, we're in court. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it does recognize, right? You know, you're not advancing, you're advancing in a position, not a goal or interest of your client, right? You're yeah. doing the yeah, truth. But- Russ, I think the main thing for people to really understand is that most of our judges are now collaboratively trained professionals. Yeah. They understand the principles and they actually are really quite positive when legal counsel is coming forward and saying, I want to try X, Y, and Z. I want to try, you know, using some of these collaborative principles going forward. It's great for them. Like, Everybody's I, I've been before courts, judges in the Central or East region. This is pre-pandemic. And we would have these, uh, you know, counsel from out of town come in and make salacious allegations in their brief and disparaging comments about the lawyer on the other side. And the judge cuts them off at the knees. They say, in this jurisdiction, we don't practice this way. I'm not going to tolerate that kind of tone or content. And really cuts the, the lawyer down to size. Like, that we're acting in a civil, amicable fashion here. And I know that lawyer and the, the allegation you're making is completely false. So judge, you're right. The ones with CP training, they're gonna do everything they can. I wanna be mindful of our time. We're gonna to get to some more Q and A, um, 30 seconds or less, Jonathan, advantages. Advantages are, um, it's, it's a collaborative instead of an adversarial process, it's faster. Um, <clears throat> it can be more expensive up front, but in the long run, it's way cheaper than court. Um, and the clients end up with all of the, both of their needs being met instead of the win-lose situation you often see at court. Um, and it's, it's highly adaptable. And I think as a professional, it's way better because you get supported by the team. Yeah. All right. Gary, yeah. risks and pitfalls, 30 seconds or less. Oh, you know, I have a hard time finding the risks and pitfalls with uh, collaborative. I think the main risk here is people not signing on because they're so engrossed in the idea that court is is something that's going to give them justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not realizing that their compelling argument is not going to be heard the way they need it or want it to be heard. And honestly... I think that's the main one is that people have this TV idea of what court is and it's just not there. I think the, the risk is you go back to court, right? You know, yeah. the objections I hear, especially when we're pulling high conflict cases out of the courts, you know, there's trust issues, there's credibility issues, there's non-compliance with court orders. I even had a case where mom took the child out of jurisdiction and yep. we needed to go to Manitoba to get an, well, an order in Ontario returning the child here to be enforced out there. Um, you here. know, though, Russ, I, I look at those things and, you know, somebody that's not being compliant in the collaborative process, they're not going to be compliant in the court process either. But the trust and credibility issues, if we bring in somebody like Carrie or Jonathan, this is a neutral. They don't have a dog in the fight, right? They're going to present the data. And they're going to discuss the data and they're going to answer any questions that you have. You don't get that dialogue in court, right? You get, unless you go to trial, but it's not a dialogue. It's a a hearing with rules of evidence. Um, Going to court, again, if you're having problems convincing your client to go collaborative, try to understand why. If it's a specific narrow issue, maybe sever that issue and say, okay, we're going to do full CP, save and accept for this one issue that we agree we will return to the case management judge uh, for uh, to adjudicate our recommendation. 99% of your case will get settled. That one issue, you go back to court, the judge is going to be happy. You've narrowed the issues down from 99 to 1. They're going to give you the time to get that resolved. All right, so how do we get training? Carrie, help us out. What's involved? money, time, where can people yeah. learn more? So we have a training coming up with Brian Galbraith, myself, and Bev LeMay. Brian Galbraith is actually now our president of the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. So you're getting the big dog. Um, <laughs> our training right now is Ooh. coming up. 
<laughs> no, Brian so, is Brian is fantastic. You ever get a chance to see him speak or participate in his training? He's yeah. he's a world leader when it comes to collaborative practice. Absolutely. So for us, our next training is November 10th to December 1st. It is Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. We start at 1230 till 430. Yes, there are breaks in there. Don't worry. We don't make you sit there for the entire time. Uh, cost is 1950 plus HST. And that's just because the CRA needs their piece of everything we do. Um, but we have a, a website, cptraining.ca. You can go to that site, you can click on introductory training and you can register. It's open right now. I think we have three spots left. That was the last I was hearing. Um, and the other thing that we do offer is advanced training um, for anybody that is already collaboratively trained and would like some advanced principal training and everything else. We're happy to do that too. And we got questions coming in. Yes, CP training is available for non-lawyers. Uh, we yes, have yes. real estate agents. We have mortgage brokers. It's a great way to network. It's a great social way workers. To social yeah. workers. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, our sorry, Russ. Our CP training is for everyone. It is for the family professionals. It is for uh, financials. It is for legal counsel. For anybody that wants to take the training. And I've taken it with Carrie, and I can say it was great. Yeah, and I've talked with Carrie and the money, don't worry about the money. If you think the amount of hours these trainers put in, they're not making any money. They'd make more money doing their private practice and training others, but they're doing it because yeah. they're passionate and they're making it available. I think yours is remote, right? So you don't need to attend in person. Yeah, we are completely Zoom focused, which is great. So you can work at your desk in the morning, get some billable hours in, then you can do the training in the afternoon. We yeah. scheduled it this way simply because we know it's hard for people to get away from their practices. Yeah. So I, I, I spoke to Brian yesterday. He says there's a few spots left, so sign up. Uh, thank you. People have been giving us their feedback on the review link Shannon gave in. Let's wrap this up, Shannon. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left for Q&A. Uh, this is also a good opportunity to go to the chat box, click the link, and provide not just Carrie and I and Shannon, uh, but Jonathan comments in terms of our performance today. Welcome mm -hmm. back, Shannon. Thank you. And just on that note, um, there will also be a survey that pops up at the end of this session um, that we'll be asking for your feedback. As Russ mentioned, it's just really important to us um, as it allows us to help us grow our, our event series and give us some in, insights into what you're looking to see in the future. So we really appreciate that. Um, and as a sign of our appreciation, we'll be sending you a complimentary ebook um, in return. So that brings us to our Q&A. So I know that there was a lot of questions answer, answered throughout the presentation, which is great, um, but I think we can sneak maybe one more in here. Um, so we have, how do collaborative practice methods make advocates more effective lawyers as just kind of maybe some closing comments from our panel? Um, well, <clears throat> you get to distinguish between positions and goals and interests and you get to better understand um, What's really important to your client? A lot of lawyers just apply the law to the facts, say, here's your, this is the outcome. This is the equalization. This is the parenting schedule. This is what the support guidelines say your support should be. Collaborative turns its on, turn it on its head. The clients get to decide, no, this is what I think is important. Go structure an agreement that reflects that. How's that, Carrie or John? Two minutes or less. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I think for I think for the advocate where collaborative is a really great thing is that you actually do get to see really clearly what's going on with the other side, and you can see how how to mold this so that it is a, it it becomes a win win for the family, and I think that's the key is that you got to look at this. This is a family. Um, we can't lose that. Yeah, Jonathan, any thoughts? Yeah, I think. For like reducing conflict, making the process less painful for your client, uh, the support of the team are all really uh, good reasons to to practice collaborative practice. And it, you know, I I've, I can tell a difference between someone who's been collaboratively trained and someone who hasn't. And um, uh, I, I think the difference is is quite enormous. All right. So allegory of the cave. Come see the light. Carry on <laughs> November. Perfect. <laughs>
Okay, so that looks like it's all the time we have. We just want to thank everyone in our audience again for joining us today and for all of your participation. And those of you who have, who have already sent in your feedback, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much, Carrie and Jonathan, for being here to share your, your knowledge and expertise and your time um, for the discussion with Russell today. We do really appreciate it. Um, and as I mentioned, we do love hearing from all of you. So um, that survey will pop up just as the webinar closes. So if you have any comments for us, please feel free to share. Um, for anyone who is new to our audience, I just like to mention that we do host these events bi-weekly on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. And our next presentation will be on bankruptcy and breakdown of the marriage on October 19th. So um, I can send you information in that follow-up email that will be including show notes, um, additional resources from today, and I'll also include um, information on our upcoming events as well. So thank you again, everyone. We really appreciate you being here and we hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Jonathan, Carrie, Shannon. Remember, if you want to learn more, you can see Jonathan live next week. Uh, the link's in the box. You want training or if you want to spend more time with Carrie, who doesn't, November, I think is the training. <laughs> Carrie. Yes, November. That's a, that's a few hours over uh, several weeks, right? Yep, that right. is true. Thank you so much, everybody. Shannon, excellent as always. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much Thanks for everyone. this. is a lot of fun. I really appreciate it.